thank you very much for coming. I know it's uh, close to lunchtime and you're probably all very hungry. So I appreciate it even more that you just came out to listen to me rant about uh, why I hate passwords. Are there any password lovers in the room? Nobody really is passionate about passwords. That's good, otherwise I might offend you. Um, so we're not going to do that today. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is passwords. I'm going to, we're going to see a bit of history and I'm going to complain a bit about passwords because I don't like them personally. And we're going to ramp up to see some alternatives for passwords. Um, so let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Sam Bellen and I'm a developer advocate engineer at Alt Zero. Um, I just, Alt Zero just got introduced, so I don't have to do that myself. And what a developer advocate does is mainly just talk with developers, connect with communities, see what's new and, and, and trending in communities, and see also what communities and developers need. Um, and then we just slapped engineer on, on the back of that because I know how to write code, and otherwise you would not believe me. Um, I'm a Google developer expert, which means that somebody at Google decided that I know something about the internet. Um, and organize a few meetups, one in Belgium, Frontiers, which is mostly front-end related, and one in London, which is the identity and security meetup. Um, so if you're ever in London or Frontiers doing one of those events, please join us. We're all very friendly people. Um, and you can find me on the internet as Sam Bagel. Now, very important, I have cat stickers. So if you like cat stickers, send me a picture of your cat, your dog, your sheep, whatever animal you have on your phone. Um, tweet it to me, and I'll give you some stickers after this talk at the Meet the Speaker desk. Um, all right. So a little summary of what we're going to see today. A bit of history on passwords, because passwords have been along for a very long time. Um, some different types of passwords, because we have to talk about what a password is and which different types of passwords are there before we can start bashing on them and telling, uh, before I can tell you why I hate them. Um, we're going to see a bit about passwordless authentication, and last but not least, um, a very new um, API, the Web Authentication API. Um, we're going to end with that. So to start off, a bit of history on passwords. Passwords date back to the Romans and probably even before that. So if you would be living in the Roman, Roman time and you would be in a certain legion of Romans and you would be walking across a, a strange land and you would meet some other people, to know if they were enemies or friends of yours, you would probably have some password that you would say to each other and if the password was correct, you'd go and drink some beer. If the password was wrong, then, well, you would fight of, uh, for that piece of land. So Romans have been uh, using passwords since a long time, before Christ. Um, but even after that, like in the 10th century, there was this um, book called 1001 Nights. It's, uh, it take, takes place in Arabia, um, and it talks about 40 thieves who steal a lot of gold and jewels and stuff like this. And they hide this in a cave, and to open that cave, they have to use a magic password, open sesame. Um, and when you say open sesame, the cave opens, and you can get to the, to the, the gold and stuff. So open, open sesame basically is also a password. Um, if you skip forward, uh, forward a bit, because there's so many um, use cases of passwords in the past, and we go to 1961. This um, person, Fernando Corbato, worked at MIT, um, and they invented the first um, collateral time-sharing system. And what this means, back in the 60s, not everybody had a computer in their pocket, a computer on their lap. They had one computer at MIT, but any of the researchers at the university wanted to use that computer, wanted to use computer time, so they all got a few hours, let's say four hours, and they could use that computer for those four hours. But they all wanted to have their own separate files, and they wanted to keep it a bit private um, so that the other researchers could not see what they were doing. So they invented a time-sharing system, and they would lock their own individual files. Each person would lock their files with a password. Um, so if we talk in terms of computer science, passwords have been around since roughly 6061. Um, and then we skip forward to the 70s. Robert Morris Sr. worked at Bell Laboratories. He invented hashing, um, which means that at least the first nine years of passwords on computers, they were just stored as plain text, um, which is not good. Um, if you deal with passwords, you should hash, hash them, you should sell them. Um, but this also shows us that from the 70s onwards, people were taking security a bit more serious um, because of the rise of computers and stuff like this. And then we end up in the 90s, the internet, big bubble, a lot of companies started to go to the internet, and a lot of bad people started to see these, these companies go to the internet and start, started to see opportunities. So they started to hack um, certain web services, get access to data which they're not allowed to see. Um, so hacking became more of an issue. Um, so that's a very short introduction. It started with Romans and went up straight to 2019. These days, we all try to keep our passwords and any personal data or, or, or privacy sensitive data very secure. It doesn't always work like this. Um, and we often use a password to log into certain services. So let's look at, a, so at a, 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 a group of types of passwords. The first word of the first slide I want to, to talk about is what is a password? And to me, a password is anything that's a shared secret. As long as you can take this, this thing 
and share it with somebody and still keep it secret between the two parties of you, that can be a password. And the most common example is a string. Don't use password 1234. Uh, I think that's obvious. Um, my first password when I was very young, I had a Hotmail account, which doesn't work anymore. You don't have to try it. I had cold dog. Don't know why. Um, but it usually looks a bit like this. If you, if you want to have a more secure um, password, it's usually a bit longer, often with random characters, something you cannot uh, remember on your own. Um, and the downside on this is it can be hard to, to, to remember if you have this randomly looking or, or actually random um, series of characters. Um, but a password manager can help you remember this for all the websites out there. Um, but it can also be hard to guess by others. So if somebody wants to try to force their way into your account, if you have a very long password, it can be a bit hard for them to guess your passwords. Um, so that's, a, that's an upside of using strings, and especially long, randomly looking strings um, for passwords. Um, the second one is a PIN code. And we all know this. We all have a, a banking card, which we can use with a four or five digit uh, PIN code. We all have a SIM card on our phone, which you can unlock with four digits. Uh, maybe if you want to enter your apartment building, you have to type in some PIN code uh, next to the door to open the front door. Um, and this is usually three, four, five, six. Doesn't matter, a few numbers. Um, which you can choose. And the problem with this is they're not so hard to guess. Because it's just three numbers, four numbers, five numbers, the combinations are not limitless. They're, it's a very limited set of, of combinations. So if you just try to brute force it, that's not that, that, that difficult. But the good thing is they're often combined with something physical. You need your banking card to use a PIN code of that card. You need your SIM card to use a PIN code of that card. You need the little box next to your door to enter the PIN code to actually use that PIN code. So if somebody got hold of your PIN code, but without the physical uh, artifact, the physical thing, it's still useless. So this physical thing tied to the PIN code makes it a bit more um, secure. Um, but, the but the upside is it's fairly easy to remember. We can all remember four digits, um, at least most of us. Um, and it's usually used with the access to the physical thing, like I said before, cards, uh, your phone, your keypad, whatever you have. Um, next one is a pattern. And, and if you use an Android phone, you might use something like this to unlock your phone. Who uses this on, your, on their phone? I see a bunch of hands. Now, the main reason why people use this is mainly because it's a very easy uh, way of unlocking your phone. It's very easy to remember um, a pattern. Um, and what this is, it basically just translates to a certain code. This can be a pin code, can be something else. But in the back end of that system, it just transforms your pattern into a code, uh, a password, if you will. Um, and one of the downsides of this is that touchscreen can be a bit dirty, um, unless you clean your touchscreen with every use. Um, nobody does that. So you might reveal your uh, pattern on your touchscreen as dirty spots. Um, and people often use their initial letter of their name or a lucky number, so it's easier to guess. Um, but the upside, it's very easy to remember. It's a pattern, it's something visual, it's something you can do and you can put it in your muscle memory even. Um, so it's easy to remember. Um, so what are the problems with passwords? If you look at this very simple login form, which you see on, on every website out there these days, um, we try to log in. But of course, the first time you try to log in, you never type your password correct from the first time. Who does that? I think a lot of people are lying in this room. Um, so you don't do that, so of course you try the second time. Um, wrong again, third time's a charm. Um, let me try one more time. No. So what do you do? You're like, OK, I forgot my password. I'm going to reset my password. So you're going to reset your password, type a, pa a new password. Um, and then you get a message like this. Who's ever had a message like this? Because you think you forgot your password, but then actually you just were nervous or sweaty or you just went running or you, you didn't sleep good enough and you just didn't type your password good enough. So you try to reset it and the password you want to reset or use as a reset password is actually your old password. And that's very annoying. The, use, the user experience of passwords is very annoying, except uh, also the case that it's very easy to, to steal often. Um, so passwords in, in general are very, very annoying. Um, that's me when I have to use passwords. Um, if you use a password manager, it can help you with inputting and remembering them. Um, so that makes it better for the user experience side and, 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 and stuff, make the security a bit better. But still, if a password gets stolen, you're in a lot of trouble. Um, like I said, user data can get stolen, passwords get get stolen, um, any private, uh, private data can get stolen. Um, so last year, Google lost 52 million um, records, no passwords, um, but pri private data was included. Um, Facebook lost a lot of it, also no passwords. None of the examples I'm going to give did actually lose plain text passwords. Some lost some encrypted passwords, but it's just to show how much data gets stolen on a 
almost daily, weekly basis um, with the internet and the internet usage that we have today. Um, Quora, 100 million. My Fitness Pal, 150 million. You can see the trend is going up. Marriott Hotels, 500 million um, user records were stolen last year. Um, and if some of their IT guys or girls did not do a certain thing right, and they might have saved their passwords in plain text, which happens with big companies. Google, for example, did this for a certain amount of users this year, um, and they just figured it out after years of using it. People might be able to steal your passwords, and when you steal a password, it's very easy to um, log into other people's systems. Um, we at Ozero have a little trick for that. Um, it's called breach password detection. Anytime a user tries to log in through our system with um, a password or a username password combination that has been known to be breached before, we will uh, notify that user um, and also notify the website to which it's going to um, log in. Um, if you don't like Ozero, Google Chrome has also an extension that does exactly the same, just an extension. And if you want to use a password that's, uh, that's been known to be breached, or a combination username password is going to alert you um, for that, so you can change your password, which you should do, of course, if it's been breached. Um, so tips for good passwords. These are not definite tips. Um, use a complex password. Uh, by complex, it's mostly linked. Um, that's the most important part. Don't use any personal data, because if you use the name of your cat or, or your mom, it's very hard, very easy to um, socially engineer um, your, your passwords. Don't reuse passwords, so try to reuse, uh, try to use a password, a, a, a unique password for every website or every service you use. And then something that you should do, but nobody does it, I don't even do it myself, change your passwords frequently. Um, it's annoying, but it just helps to be a little bit more secure. Should your password get stolen after a certain time, it will not be valid because you changed your password. Um, so some tips. Let's fast forward, forward a bit as well. Um, we end up at passwordless. Um, who's used any form of passwordless before in this room? See a bunch of hands, cool. Um, the, f the, the most common one is one-time password. This is usually used as a second factor, not as a first factor. Um, and it, it's valid for one-time use. Uh, after you've used this code for one time, it's going to be expiring and it's going to be invalid. It's usually only valid for a certain amount of time. And it's often or mostly or always actually sent directly to the user. Um, can be in the form of an SMS. Like if you want to use a second factor and you get sent an SMS code um, to use that, um, that's a one-time password. And on iOS and Android, um, if you get one of those SMSs, your keyboard will automatically tell you that you want to input this code you just got in a text message. So that's very convenient. Um, also, after you've used this, this code, it's invalid, of course. Um, so it's a one-time use password. Um, sadly, not all, all telecom operators take security issues, security serious, um, so SMS messages can be intercepted. That's just the reality of how it is, um, but let's just assume that they're not intercepting our messages. Um, who knows? And you need your cell phone close by, like if you want to log in on your laptop and your cell phone is upstairs in your bedroom, you have to run upstairs to get your phone to use this, um, this to, to read this text message. So it can be a bit more annoying. Um, you can also send them in an email. If you use Slack, you might have used the email me a link button. It's a magic link. You click on it, and you're magically logged in. Basically, that, that link contains a one-time password as well. So you don't need a second device, because usually you have your email accessible on the device you're, you're logging into. Um, and emails can be intercepted. That's one of the downsides. Like uh, text messages, also emails can be intercepted. Um, the third example is an authenticator app, um, something like Google Authenticator. Who uses an app like this? That's a lot more hands than I saw one I asked who uses one-time passwords. Um, so that's funny. Um, but basically what this does, it, it generates, um, generates one-time passwords which expire after a certain date, and you can use them for every service that you, that you um, configured it with. Um, we have the or our own version, which is um, the Guardian app, does the same thing. Um, and there's a bunch of other uh, apps that do this kind of thing, creating one-time passwords. Duo, LastPass, Aldi, even Microsoft has their version, so a lot of big companies are behind this one-time password um, authenticator app thingy. Um, and they're often time-based, like I mentioned, they expire after 30 seconds, for example. So if you would, you would copy it and paste it a few seconds too late, it would not be a valid one-time password anymore. Um, like you see in this example of the authenticator app, your text or your, your password becomes red, and um, it will create a new one after a certain amount of time. And they can also be push-based. Like you could receive a push message on your phone, click on it, and you're logged in. No need to copy a code, paste it in somewhere else, just click on a push message, and it does its magic. Um, but the downside of this is that you need a shared secret between the authenticator app and your service. 
Um, so if this secret gets leaked somehow, um, you might run into some problems. Next one, social login. We use this once in a while. A lot of hands. And the reason why we use this, just it's convenient. You already have a Google account, or you already have a Facebook account if you really trust them with your data. Same for Google. For, um, um, so you just log in with them, you register with them, you don't have to type all of your personal data again and again and again. You just click on it, logged in or registered. Um, it's easy. Um, and the upside of that is it's one less password to remember. You don't have to remember it's a unique password for each service that you're using. You just have to remember your Gmail password. Um, and you also only give a password to a service that you trust. If you use login with Google, it kind of means that you trust Google with your passwords. Same for Facebook and the other services. Um, so you're not going to give the password to some shady website that you're registering on. Um, you're, you're passing it along to Google um, or the other services. Um, but you also rely on that service. You rely on Google, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, to handle your authentication. If they go down, you cannot log into any other website you've used um, social log login on. If they don't handle your data very well, um, they can do whatever they want with it. So you rely on that other service for authentication, which is a downside. Um, some other authenticator apps, it's me, it's something Belgium. Um, Yodi does um, some facial recognition thingies. It's very powerful, very cool. Voice it uses voice recognition to log you in um, instead of passwords. Um, works well as well. So there's a bunch of different techniques of, of logging people in passwordless, um, at least in the front end, uh, with things as facial recognition, uh, voice recognition, but also one time passwords. Um, and they're often used as a second factor. Uh, most of the time when you see these, they're used as a second factor, which means you're going to log in with a password, and then a second time you have to authenticate um, with one of these one-time passwords. Um, that's just because that's how they work at the moment. Um, but that might be changing soon. Um, and lastly, I want to talk about the Web Authentication API. Who's ever heard of the Web Authentication API before? It's something relatively new. Um, I mean, the spec has been out for a few for for a while now, but it's a it's standardized spec right now, and it's often called Web Authn. Um, so if you ever want to Google more about this this API, just search for Web Authn on Google. You'll find more results than Web Authentication API, and it's also less characters to type. So that's that's awesome. Um, and what it is, it's a key-based authentication mechanism. You'll use a private key and a public key to log in or to authenticate instead of a password, um, which makes it a bit more secure because you're only going to share your public credentials and keep your private credentials somewhere secure on an authenticator device. Um, and it uses, an, an uses a hardware authenticator. Um, who of you owns a YubiKey or a Google Titan key or any of those 10-ish people? So you have a bunch of these hardware devices um, from Google, from YubiKey. Um, you have them for your phone. You have them for your, your laptop. You even have open source hackable ones if you really want to. Um, so I have a bunch of these. You can come look at them later if you want. I even have one, one with a screen which shows you a lot of data um, if you really want to get fancy. But basically, these are hardware authenticators, and they will store your private credentials um, somewhere securely on a chip. Um, and they will never be able to. You will never be able to take those private credentials of them. Only the public um, data you need to actually authenticate. Um, for example, a YubiKey, USB-C, you have them in any variant. You have them for USB, Bluetooth, low energy, NFC, even have a mobile app um, called Krypton, I believe, um, which does the exact same thing. It's going to let you uh, log in with the Web Authentication API. Um, so I asked who has one. Um, I saw maybe 10, 10 hands. And if you have one, you, your login form could potentially be just a login button. Now, if I, can, if I click this button, it's going to ask me to touch my authenticated device, which I have attached to my laptop. Um, it's going to do some, some actions, and if it, when it completes, I will get back the ID of a private key that it has used to do the certain things. Um, so it asks me, use your security key with the local host. Um, I'll touch it, minus pin code protected. That's not always the case. That depends on how secure it will be. Um, you touch it again, and since I'm a local host, I have to allow it every time again and again and again. Um, but the end result is that we get um, some public key data and also an ID of a private key, which is stored on this device. We'll not be able to take that off, um, but we get the ID of this uh, public key, um, which is cool because this means that we can log in with this little authenticator device instead of using passwords. Um, so I've asked who has one of these. Ten people raised their hands. Now, if I ask you who has a laptop or a phone that's younger than ten years, I think everybody's hand goes up, right? So th the truth is that most modern devices have one of these devices built in. They have a separate chip in their chipset. Apple has the A whatever chip. 
Um, Intel has a, their, their special designated chip that does nothing more than save, create and save um, credentials and then just uses the credentials to sign challenges. Um, so any modern device has this. My laptop here has Touch ID, so it will allow me to use Touch ID to do the exact same action we saw before uh, with the YubiKey. So if I click on this button, instead of touching my uh, USB authenticated device, I'm going to use the internal one. It's going to ask me, can you please touch your Touch ID? When I do so, uh, I have to allow it again because I'm a local host. But I get the exact same thing. I get some public key data, and I get an ID of a private key, um, which I can then use to authenticate. So most of us have this in their devices. You don't need an extra device. If you're fine with that, you can actually use this already today if services would be implementing this. Which is awesome, because I can just log in with my fingerprint. I don't need, any, need to type anything anymore. I need to remember passwords. Passwords cannot get stolen. The only thing that can get stolen is, is public key data, which is public, so it doesn't really matter. So how does this work exactly? <coughs> the first thing you need to do is you need to create new credentials. You need to create a new uh, public key and private key pair um, for each service you want to use this with. So we'll type in a username because we still are going to have a username. Um, we send this to a, a, a backend server, an authentication or authorization server, and we get back a challenge. And a challenge is basically just a random array, array buffer. So an array buffer with random values. We um, relay this back to the authenticator device, this challenge, and the authenticator device is going to take your private key to sign this challenge um, and then send back uh, it usually requires some user interaction, like touching your USB device, using Touch ID, um, stuff like this. And then it's going to sign back the sign challenge, a public key, and the ID of your private key that signed the challenge. So you're going to save those, those credentials in your server. And the next time uh, when a user comes back to your service and it wants to authenticate, because now it registered, it can just use the, uh, the exact same mechanism um, to authenticate. So the user types in his username already. Um, we're going to check in our database. Do we have a, a credential saved for this user? If so, we'll send the ID of the private key that it used the previous time to register um, together with a new challenge. Relay that information to your authenticator device, which is going to check, do I have a private key with this ID stored on my, on myself, on my device? If so, it's going to use that private key um, to sign the challenge. User interaction again, and then send that data back. And because um, we use the same private key. We can use the previously saved public key uh, information on our server to determine that the user has used the same device, so it's allowed to authenticate for this account. Um, so to recap, because it's a, it's a bit a bit more complex, you request a challenge um, when you want to register, which is a, a array buffer with random values. You sign that challenge on your authenticator device, and then you send back a signed challenge, the raw ID of your, pri of, your public of your private key and some public key information data. And you save those somewhere in the database um, together with your username so you can find it when you need to use it. Um, and then when you want to authenticate, you just uh, request a challenge and you request the raw ID of the private key that the user has used previously to register. Send this to your authenticator device um, and it will use that private key to sign a challenge again and then send it back to your backend where you will determine that it's the same key that um, signed the challenge based on the public key credentials. So the only thing that gets stored is public data. Public key, public key credentials, an ID of a private key, but it's only the ID, it's an identifier, it doesn't really define anything else about the private key and maybe a username which could be a bit more privacy sensitive, but it's not a disaster if that gets leaked in terms of people will still need, uh, need to have access to your authenticator device if they really want to log in with your username. Um, so let's look at some code. First, to create credentials, you have navigator.credentials.create, um, and it accepts a bit of config um, about the public key. The first thing is your challenge, your, uh, your buffer with some random values. Um, some information about the relaying party, so your authorization server or the website you're going to use this with, my website, uh, your website, whatever you want. Um, then some information about the user you want to register with, so an ID, a name, display name, stuff like that. Um, and then some in information about which public key credential or which algorithms you want to support. Um, there's a whole list of these, I don't know, um, right here, which has a value in a and numbers, so you don't have to type the exact value, the exact uh, algorithm names. So if you look up for um, minus seven, I think you will find that it's ES two five six, which means that in this example, we'll allow ES two five six as the algorithm to sign 
um, the challenges. Um, you can, it's an array, you can pass along as many as you want. Um, just know that there's a list of out there with all the supported algorithms. Then a timeout, how much time the user will have to complete the whole process. This is in milliseconds. And then um, f if for some reason you want to exclude certain credentials, you could do this in this array. Um, it has some use cases, but it's a bit more advanced usage of this API. And lastly, some information about the authenticator itself. If, for example, you only want to allow external uh, authenticators, the USB ones or Bluetooth ones, you could do that. If you only want to allow the internal ones, Touch ID on, on your MacBook Pro, for example, you could do this. If you only want to allow authenticated devices that uh, verify a user, you can do that. Um, and you could also uh, require them to use a resident key, which we'll see a bit later. Um, and then some information about the attestation, if we're going to send some public data back from the authenticated device or if it's all anonymized. And then once you've created this, you can use the navigator.credentials.get method. Um, again, it uses some config or it accepts some config, um, a challenge, again, a, a, a buffer with some random data. And then the credentials that it allows, and this is going to be the credentials that you've saved in your backend in the database. So you're going to pass along the ID of the private key it has to use on your authenticated device. You can specify in waste ways. Um, it can be transported with USB, NFC, Bluetooth, whatever. You don't have to. Um, and then again, you can specify if you would like the authenticated device to be uh, user verification uh, enabled. So by passing along this public key or an array of public keys, if you have multiple saved, the user will, the authenticated device will check for this uh, key and sign the challenge with this private key. Um, so we've seen resident credentials, and this is where it really gets interesting, because up until now we had to save these credentials in the back end, and we had to enter a username to look up in our database like which credentials are, met, are linked to this, uh, this user, uh, which is already a big step forward because we don't have passwords anymore, but we still have to type in some things. Um, so if you set this to true in the authenticator selection, what you basically can do is um, hope that we have internet. I have it open here. So this is webauthn.me. It's basically a website we created for you to play around with the API. Um, and what we see here is the navigator that credentials that create a method, and you can just change all of the parameters on the fly. So if I would just um, type my name Warsaw and display name, we yes, whatever. Um, and we would enable, uh, require a resident key. This means that now instead of sending all this public data to our database and saving it there, we're going to save this, per this, this personal data on the authenticator device. Um, so we're going to do that. Um, I use my, my key, touch it, type my pin code. Oh. Next, touch it again. And now I get some uh, some feedback back. I get my public key credentials. I get it, still get it back, but it also saved Warsaw and username we asked with a certain ID on uh, this this authenticated device. Which means if you want to authenticate, instead of passing along a list of credentials which we saved in the database, you can just leave it empty. And um, let's give us some more time to do this. If you want to authenticate now, instead of passing along some safe credentials to the authenticated device. We're just doing nothing, and the authenticated device is going to look to have some credentials saved on me, which I can use for this website. It's always tied to the origin of the website, um, so this prevents phishing as well. Um, so I touch it, I type my pin code, um, and then next, touch it again. And what we get now is a list of all the user credentials that are saved on my authenticator device for this website. And as you can see, the user we just created, WS with Warsaw's name, has been saved on this. If I click on this, I am now logged in with that user. So no need to enter a username anymore, no need to enter a password anymore. It all gets saved on the authenticated device. And anytime you want to log in, what you're basically going to do is ask your authenticated device, do you have some users saved for this website? If so, can I please use this user to log in? Um, you can save multiple on this authenticated device if you want to, or just use your own personal one, whatever you want. It's up to you. If you want to play around with this, webauthn.me slash debugger. Um, but there are still some issues to be solved. User credential management. We've seen that we can save user credentials on the authenticated device, but you can't really manage them. You cannot edit them. You cannot delete them. You can delete all of them at once, but you cannot delete a certain user credential. So that's still something that needs to be figured out. Um, cross device credentials, if I create, create my credentials on this USB device, I can take it to another computer. 
but I cannot plug this one into my phone, so I need another uh, authenticated device for my phone, or if I use a built-in one, I cannot transfer these credentials to a new computer should this one be broken or crash or whatever or get stolen. Um, again, yeah, lost or stolen authenticated device recovery means that they're lost, all the credentials, so you should always have a backup way of logging in, either with a second authenticated device, either with a, a second way of authenticating, maybe a password, maybe something else, who knows? Um, so you need to um, think about these use cases when you don't have access to your authenticator device anymore. So WebAuthn might replace passwords. I hope so. It's a, it's a standard. It has very good support. Um, but it does not replace token-based authentication like OAuth or IDC. It does not pr replace identity providers because I get this question a lot. It's just a different way of providing the actual authentication, proving that somebody is allowed to do something, not what happens after that. Um, it's a W3C recommendation, which means it's a finalized spec. Um, it's um, supported in all browsers, all modern browsers, Chrome, Firefox, Edge, and even in the latest Safari, which has been uh, launched in, I think, October. And if you want to use it on, on iOS, on your iPhone, the latest beta has also um, some support for this. Um, but to get this unstable, we still have to wait until that beta uh, becomes stable. So where can we use this already? Any of the big websites support this. If you want to log in with an authenticated device instead of a website, uh, instead of a password on these Google GitHub, but Dropbox, for example, is another example, um, you can just use that already using the Web Authentication API. Um, they wrote some blog posts about this. I will share these slides for with you later so you can click on these links. It um, doesn't load because I don't have internet, but if you want to know more about um, the Web Authentication API, webauthn.me, that's webauthn. Dot me. It has um, some interactive tutorial which shows you what goes on between the server, the browser, and the authenticator device. Has some information and has the debugger which allows you to play around with it. So let's summarize. <laughs> Boo passwords. I don't like passwords. Um, I hope you all don't like them either. Um, one time passwords are cool, um, but they're sometimes a bit annoying to use. And WebAuthn is even cooler because you can just potentially log in with using your Touch ID or Face ID on your phone or on your laptop. Um, in a secure way because it uses pri private keys and public keys. If you want to know more, again, webauthend.me. Uh, the spec is surprisingly readable, so if you like to read specs, this one is a, one is a good one to start with because it's quite clear compared to some other specs. Um, I wrote some blog posts uh, if you want to know more details as well or just come talk to me. Um, you can find these slides at 1990.sambigo.tech. Uh, I'll tweet them out later as well, but if you want to take a picture, go ahead. Um, and that being said, thank you very much. Let's go eat.